Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seminar again. Our today's speaker is uh, Vincent Van Ele. He was actually, he did his bachelor and uh, master in Kai, at Kaya Leuven, uh, and then uh, uh, I think you were on Erasmus, right, for a year, uh, Vincent, in Aarhus University, and then he liked it so much that he decided to do his PhD there as well. After a PhD, he has done a couple of postdocs, one in Leiden and one in uh, the Princeton University. And as of uh, 2019, Vincent is an associate uh, professor at the University College uh, London. And uh, today he's gonna tell us about how we can understand uh, planets through their uh, host stars. Yeah, please, Vincent. Thank you, Andrew, for the kind introduction. It's great to be back here. Uh, I think the first time, really, uh, since I was a student here. So I think the last time I was in this room, I was sitting right there. Um, but it was definitely not on a Thursday morning. So it's great to be back here, and I want to talk today about how to understand um, planets through their host stars. So it's going to be a bit of a mix of exoplanets, as well as some stellar physics, and what we can learn about the properties of extrasolar planets, um, and how we need stellar properties to get to that point. So I'm going to start with a bit of a general introduction and then highlight uh, what I think is some of the more interesting discoveries of the last uh, few years. Right. Whoa. So um, this is my kind of cartoon of uh, all the known exoplanet systems. There's 5,000 planets in there, and in white are the planets in the solar system. So there's eight white dots there. You can probably see uh, Jupiter, um, Neptune, Uranus, uh, very clearly, but then you could see the smaller white dots uh, as well. Um, so it says Earth and Mercury, right? And so the other planets there, the 5,000 exoplanets, are to scale. So it gives you some idea of just how many um, other worlds we have now that we can um, study. And they were primarily big, especially historically, primarily Jupiter-sized, but increasingly there's many Earth-sized uh, and small Neptune-sized or Earth-sized planets there just as, as well, right? So there's 5,000, and we're using them as laboratories to study things like how planets form. Um, also, how does our own solar system fit into that picture? Does that mean we're somehow special or not special at all? And what kind of planets exist? Uh, what are the categories of planets that exist? Are there types of planets that don't exist in the solar system, for example? And how common are they? Um, how many stars have planets, and what kind of planets do they have? And ultimately, also questions like, what atmospheres do some of these planets have? And also, uh, in the long run, of course, there's this final question we would really like to answer, which is whether there, are, uh, whether there is life on any of these planets, uh, and whether we are alone in the universe or, um, or not. Right. So with that pitch, I'll just show you a little bit more generally where um, uh, we are at in an actual, more scientific version of these same planets now. So this is the um, semi major axis, so the distance between a star and a planet, um, and the mass of a planet. And so if you put the solar system up here, this is the solar system planets. Um, and so you can see the eight solar system planets with Earth there at one AU and one Earth mass, as it should be. Right. And so immediately, just from the solar system, you see the eight planets in the solar system, or nine if you want to count Pluto, which I kindly put up here for the fans. Um, you can immediately sort of see that they're, you know, this is a log-log plot, so they're actually quite different um, from one another, right? For example, Jupiter's 300 times the mass of um, the Earth, right? And so uh, that big diversity is borne out as well when you look at the... Um, I broke everything? What? Yeah, I wanted to move a slide. Um, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. I did something. Sorry. So if you put the, um, the, the exoplanets on the same diagram, this is somewhere where they fall, right? And so you see immediately that they also have this pretty wide diversity, uh, just like in the solar system. And in fact, they have an even bigger diversity. There's planets very far away, so some planets even further out than uh, Uranus and Neptune, and there's certainly lots of planets much closer in um, than the orbit of Mercury as well, right? And all kinds of masses there as well, and some of them 
we can't even put on this diagram because we don't even know their masses to begin with. Right? Um, and the other thing to notice probably is that, you know, actually you might be concerned that there doesn't seem to be anything sort of where the solar system is, um, and that's primarily a detection issue, so it's not so much that we, don't, that, that we think there is no planet um, where Earth or Venus fall, for example, but it's just these are the hardest ones to find. Right? And so um, if you color code this by detection method, you can see that much more clearly. So you see these are actually discovered in different ways. Um, and each of these methods have their own advantages and drawbacks. And so um, that tells you where you can find planets. For example, the imaging planets, which are detected directly, seeing light from the planets, are at, um, you know, far, they're, they're massive planets at uh, great distances from their stars. Uh, Microlensing planets are somewhere in, in the middle, and then the radio velocity detections come from the more massive planets in general. And then the transit method, which is where most planets are known from now, is close in planets, really, right? So they're close to their star. And that's mostly a geometric effect. It's unlikely for a planet to transit when it's far away from its star. And so even if our methods would get pretty good, we're still mostly going to find close in planets with the transit method. Right. And so currently, uh, out of the thousands of planets, the majority is transiting planets, and the majority is actually interior to the orbit of Mercury. And so that's good to keep in mind, uh, because most of what I'm going to be talking about is transiting planets. And so essentially, none of these planets, um, the most common exoplanet we know, have an analog in the solar system at all. Right? They have orbits closer than that of Mercury, so there are no uh, solar system planets that are the same. Right. And so... The other thing, as general context, that I think is important to clarify is that even at this most basic level, to understand any properties of exoplanets, uh, we need to know the properties of the star. And this is how the transit method works, which uh, many are probably familiar with. So you look at a star over time, and you measure its brightness over time with an instrument typically from space. Think Kepler, TESS, or maybe Plato in the future. Uh, I probably shouldn't say maybe, Plato in the future. Um, and so then you see, you wait for a planet to cross in front for a few hours. As it crosses in front, it blocks a part of the light from the star. Um, it physically is in between us and the star. Uh, and then you have that delta flux, this, this brightness change for a few hours that you can measure. Um, but obviously you don't see, you can't resolve the star, so you don't see the actual transit happening. Right? And that delta flux is what gives you the size of the planet. Um, bigger planets block more light. But... Um, it's really a ratio between planet and star that we're measuring uh, when we do that, right? And so um, if you make the star 20% larger and the, tw the planet 20% larger, you have the same flux change. Or to invert that statement, if we want to know the size of a planet, we need to know the size of a star. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have that completely wrong. Right? And so to illustrate that in a bit more um, detail, um, this is uh, my cartoon planet illustration, where the real planet is that dotted line. So that's the real planet size. And back in the early days of Kepler, somewhere around 2014, we typically didn't know these Kepler stars very well at all. Right? Uh, and so we typically had an uncertainty, median level uncertainty at the time was something like 25% on the size of a typical solar-like, sun-like star. Right? And so that meant that the star could be 25% larger or smaller, and therefore that was the baseline error on the planets. And a planet that's 25% larger or smaller is shown there. So that's quite a difference, if you see it visually, as to just how uncertain we were about the size of planets at the time. Right. That has gotten better um, with, in one part, campaigns to follow up those specific stars where we now know have transiting planets. We took spectra for many of them, uh, and that helped a lot in, uh, in, in um, driving down that uncertainty. But also, really, the Gaia era has, has made a general difference there, and typically now we know the distance to those stars much better than we did in the past, and so we know their sizes uh, much better. And so typically, um, we should do better than 10% in most cases now. And then in the sort of what I'm going to call the gold standard here, uh, when we do some astroseismology, we can, uh, in some cases, do this to much better level. And when I'm talking here about astroseismology, I'm really talking about solar-like oscillations uh, for this purpose. So I'm talking about measuring P modes, um, measuring uh, the frequency of maximum power and the, the splitting, uh, the delta nus and nu maxes, and actually deriving densities uh, and, and even masses and radii of stars from that. So this works very well for some small set of stars, but we can then really do the percentage level um, precision um, in those cases. Right? 
And so I want to show you some examples of where this has actually given us uh, truly new science that hasn't been otherwise possible. So this is um, how the picture of planet candidates looked like in the um, early Kepler days. So this is all planets at the time candidates, so they weren't all real, um, of periods up to 100 days, and small planets sort of between Earth and Mercury size here, right? And so I didn't even put uncertainties because they're, they're quite large uh, and they dominate this plot, but you can see there's no real pattern to be seen in this diagram. Right? You don't actually notice much structure here at all. Uh, you could have just been drawing some, some noise. Right? Um, but if we actually improve this diagram over time, which happened with the spectroscopic surveys that I mentioned, in particular the California Kepler survey targeted some of these, um, things started looking like this. Right? And this is an improvement on the planet side, especially being more careful about what's real and what's not, but it's primarily an improvement on the stellar side. Right? It's an improvement on getting the stellar sizes better and therefore the planet sizes better known. Right? And what I want you to see here really is that you can now start seeing a bit of structure here at around two Earth radii. Um, you can start seeing there's perhaps a clump and another clump, uh, something like this. Right? And you might not be quite convinced yet, but it's, it's starting to, um, to appear that there's some structure to this, to this plot that just wasn't apparent um, before. And then if we look at a subset of these stars for which we have um, astroseismology uh, with the solar-like oscillations, they look something like this, right? So this is very nice p-modes uh, that people who work on hot stars are perhaps somewhat jealous of. Um, you, know, you see frequencies here in microhertz, very nice. There's the gray power and the red is the bin version. Very regular pattern. You can measure those frequencies and then um, get mass and radii of the stars from that. Right? And so if we do that for a subset of the, of the stars in the previous plot, we get much better error bars and the data points look something like this for that subset. Right? And so now you really see that structure borne out really, really clearly with basically this kind of empty, uh, empty region in here uh, in between at around two Earth um, radii. Right? So, so really, I think here the stars have given us um, a picture that we just couldn't see until we, we got these stellar properties better. And to highlight those two results, um, this one is from us and the other one um, from BJ Fulton and team, uh, this is essentially how these two plots look like. So this is the previous version with the structure, but now in one dimension, so it's a histogram where you see the bimodality very clearly, a plot that's now quite famous in the exoplanet world um, because it was the first time we saw that structure. And what we now consider the Earths or super Earths that are sort of on the, on the lower half of the size distribution, and then the Neptunes or sub-Neptunes that are on the other side of the size distribution. And then our version of that plot here, uh, where you actually uh, see that completely empty valley in between, and actually we see that it's period dependent as well, um, that it's not just something that's at the same size every period, it's actually dependent on where you are. Right? Uh, and so I think this really has marked um, a step change in our understanding of these small exoplanets, right? So until um, some years ago, we really didn't see that there was these different types, and it's now become very clear that essentially all those small planets at those period range where we're most sensitive to really come in those two flavors, and that sets the baseline of our understanding for all, what all those planets are like. Um, and so this has been uh, really kind of um, the starting point for learning about those those exoplanets, and, and I stress again, essentially, you know, Mercury would barely be on this plot, right? So, so most of those don't have an analog in the solar system, right? And it's fair to say that this wasn't a total surprise. Uh, in fact, people had actually predicted that we should be seeing something like this. When it was predicted, it wasn't apparent at all, so it was a very clean theoretical prediction, um, a prediction in the true sense of the word, uh, that came with data didn't show this at all. Uh, but people had suggested that you would um, see something like this. And the details are quite difficult to explain, but I'm going to try. So this is um, different theoretical groups there. Um, I'm showing here a plot from, from James Owen and Yan Wu, but there's others um, that have predicted this as well, dating back to 2013. Right? And so what did those people say? Well, they said these planets that are relatively close to their star should be affected quite strongly by the radiation they receive from their star. Right? In particular, the X-ray flux and the UV flux from the star, and in particular, that flux in the early days of stellar formation, let's say the first 100 million years, should be strong enough to affect the atmosphere of those close-in planets. And it should drive what they look like. 
So that basic idea is probably easy to understand. But then what they did say is what, if we simulate this, if we put a bunch of planets around a star in the early stages of formation, and even if we make them look homogeneous, so this is a histogram, it's flat with sizes of between 1 and 5, so it's essentially there's no structure in their initial conditions here. They said if we put those close to the star, we see um, something that's happening. Right? And so these planets will have a range of atmospheric properties. The atmospheres probably are mostly hydrogen and helium, which is the most common material. And they look at what happens to those atmospheres under the influence of that radiation from the star. Right? And so what they say is, they're gonna, I'm going to fill this diagram here. What they say is, uh, we can look at these atmospheres. So this is from left to right. This is a small atmosphere and then a bigger atmosphere. So a small planet and a bigger planet. And they say, well, if your planet's too big to begin with, you might lose a little bit of your atmosphere because the outer parts are quite puffy and they can be blown off by XUV flux quite easily. Um, so that's fine. That's not perhaps so, so difficult to understand. But they also said, well, if you have a small atmosphere, a really small one, it's actually really hard to hold on to that part. Um, and in fact, it's easier, it's more stable to um, hold on to a sort of intermediate atmosphere. When your atmosphere is a certain level of thickness, um, you can actually hold on to it easier. It self-shields, so it protects the inner parts of the atmosphere to a level that makes it hard to then destroy the whole atmosphere. Whereas when you have a very thin bit of atmosphere, it's very hard to hold on to that under the XUV flux. And so what they said is something like this. So they said if you put those planets close to the star, um, they will have a different level of, of radiation. This is a mass loss time scale, meaning if it's a long time scale, and they said here if it's longer than 100 million years, they would survive the first 100 million years. And they hypothesize if you're fine for 100 million years, because the XUV flux decreases after 100 million years, you will be fine forever. Right? Uh, but if you're not fine the first 100 million years, then obviously you're just not fine. And so they said if you have a thick atmosphere, you, you lose a little bit of it, so you become a bit smaller as a planet. If you have an intermediate atmosphere, you're fine. You survive 500 million years and therefore forever. But if you have a small atmosphere, you're not. You end up losing it all, and you end up with a core with no more atmosphere remaining. Right? And so they, they said the result is a distribution looking something like this, planet sizes, where you have kind of small planets, a gap with nothing in between, and then those planets with some hydrogen and helium, um, enough hydrogen and helium to make the size quite a bit larger, because hydrogen and helium kind of makes the planet a lot more puffy immediately. Right? And then they put different planets at different, si different periods. They put some closer to the star, uh, and this is closer to the star. And then it becomes more extreme, more radiation. And again, it becomes harder to hold on to atmospheres now. And so only a narrow range of atmospheres can survive. And if you go really close to the star, uh, then it, at some point, no atmosphere survive. Every planet should become completely stripped of its atmosphere. Right? So this is the predictions. Uh, and they predicted this essential combined distribution here, which looks uh, very much like what we now observe. Right? And in fact, they made a two-dimensional plot as well from the same paper. Uh, this is a theoretical prediction plot. It's not an observed, observed plot um, that came when we didn't quite know the observations yet. And they said, this is what we should be seeing. We should be seeing those Neptunes surviving, and then the Earths, which have been stripped of their atmosphere, with very little in between at around the two Earth radius. And even more so, they said, it should be kind of period dependence because of this effect that when you get closer, you have more radiation. Right? And so this is the theory prediction plot, and um, this is the observation plot, and it's really striking how, uh, how, well, those things, how well those things have matched, right? And, and I think that the baseline predictions date back from 2013, um, and at that time we didn't see this at all. In fact, the original paper makes a lot of arguments to explain why they didn't see this, uh, why it was wrong. Um, but it, it turns out to be quite, uh, quite there. Right? So this is broadly what's observed in either one dimension or two dimensions, as I showed you here. So that, that sort of makes, I think, broad sense, and I think sets our basic level of understanding for those, um, for those planets. So we now call those Neptunes and Earths, and we kind of believe that the Neptunes here have an atmosphere of mostly hydrogen helium, and the Earths are mostly atmosphere-free, with essentially no atmosphere left, and are just a rock, uh, and then by looking at the exact details of this, uh, of this valley, like exactly what its slope is, you can tell things about how strong XUV flux should be or how effective this should be. Its location should tell you something about the composition of planets. Um, if the planets are lower density, it's easier to lose atmosphere, so your valley would shift. Uh, and so you can learn a lot from the details of these, uh, of these models. So I think it's fair to say the broad picture is generally accepted. There is alternative theories, but this is the most common model. Um, the details are something that people uh, still work on very, um, very actively 
to try and understand these properties of these planets better. Right? And I want to tell you a little bit more about some of these more recent details that we've been trying to work on in our group. Um, and so this is um, uh, kind of a, a bit of an enigma that, has, um, that you might have started realizing seeing at the looking at the previous plots already, which is that um, it hasn't been clear for a long time how empty this valley really is. Right? These previous plots showed a quite different um, picture between sort of the bimodal histogram and the sort of totally empty valley. Right? And back when that happened, we kind of believed naively that this was just a stellar issue. Right? The seismology showed things were clean, and seismology was probably better, so eventually things would just become clean once you cleared up stellar parameter uh, uncertainties for everything else too. Uh, but that didn't really happen, uh, and in fact this is a 2018 result from um, uh, the same team, Felton and Pettigura, which then used Gaia at the time. And their stellar, size, uh, their stellar uncertainties became smaller and smaller, and they're not so much worse now anymore than, than the seismology we did. Uh, and so it wasn't apparent at all that the stellar properties were to blame for getting uh, a different structure in the, uh, in the radius valley's emptiness, right? Uh, you still you know, see quite a difference in those two pictures here, and you can see the uncertainties, at least the claimed uncertainties, are very, uh, starting to be very similar. Right? And so one thing that we spent some time looking at was to, to think, okay, we have now for years been really focused on getting the stars right, and perhaps we have um, neglected understanding the planet properties completely correctly, because that's obviously the other side of the uncertainty that goes into, into this, right? Um, and so we spent some new attention on the planet parameters, and in particular, uh, we looked at the effect of observing cadence. And so people who worked on Kepler or test data might, might know this general uh, idea that these, um, the light curves that you get from these space telescopes are not instantaneous observations, right? They have an integration time um, that in many cases in Kepler was 30 minutes for most stars. So you, one data point would last 30 minutes of collecting photons, and then that's one binned data point of 30 minutes. But in some cases, you'd get one minute data observation time as well, much higher sampling. Um, and the difference between those two is that you, know, you obviously resolve things better in shorter cadence, right? So in 30 minute cadence, because you, your one data point takes 30 minutes, kind of rapid changes in flux get kind of smoothed out, and so you get sort of more, um, more V-shaped kind of transits rather than the sharper transits, right? Uh, and so in short cadence, this is the more, you know, the more real original transit, and this is sort of a bin down version of that if you take a 30 minute integration time, right? Because you can't see the sharp changes as well. And so that's broadly understood, and obviously this has been taken into account since forever. This is not as such um, something unusual. But what was recognized, perhaps, or, or you know, maybe under, under recognized until more recently, is that beyond smoothing things out, this also gives you an intrinsic uncertainty on the size of the planet that's hard to overcome. And here, what I'm showing here is two planets um, crossing the star at different um, angles, right? And so because they cross at different angles, they are sensitive to the limb darkening of the star in different ways, right? These ones cross, cross over the limb, and these ones cross over the center of the star. And the transit depth itself is primarily an effect of size, but also you have this kind of limb effects. Uh, if you work on uh, planets or binary stars, you're, you're well familiar with this. And so as a result of you know, the fact that if you don't quite know where the planet crosses over, you, you can have this uncertainty on the size of a star, uh, on the size of a planet, right? And so what this is showing is that if you have two different sized planets, but you cross them at different parts of the star, um, and you don't quite know what's happening, then especially in long cadence, they can look really, really similar. Um, you can really not distinguish very well what those two planets are, and they have quite a different size, right? And in short cadence, though, you, you start seeing these are residuals, you can start seeing these, these effects more clearly because you have the sharper features of the shape uh, helping you out, right? So what we did is we went back to looking at, you know, how much short cadence data do we really have to look at, and it turned out, perhaps surprisingly, there was a lot of short cadence Kepler data available for those planets. Typically what happened is these were discovered, when they had long cadence data, and people then said we should observe them again with shorter cadence data from now on. Um, not always with a very clear goal in mind. Sometimes the goal was astrosismology, even if it didn't work out. Sometimes there were other reasons. But broadly, these shorter cadence data weren't actually used uh, because they didn't apply to everything. And most of the time when people looked at samples, they wanted to look the most general way, which was long cadence um, data. Right. And so this has been the work of um, my PhD student, Cynthia Ho, 
who essentially looked at hundreds of Kepler planets where short cadence data was available, the vast majority of it had never really been published in a sort of general sense. Right? And so then she compared these previous plots that I showed you, the Fulton and Petigura work, uh, with her own fits. And this is just a comparison plot in which, I, in which we tried to keep everything else equal. Right? We kept the same stellar parameters and the same everything, except the new transit fits. And so while things are broadly similar, you see that on individual cases, some planets really do move quite a bit. And they should be the same data, right? In principle, this uncertainty should have been incorporated in the Bayesian methods we already applied, in the Markov chains, uh, but they just, not, they just weren't always properly applied. And the net result of that, if you look at it in uh, one dimension, it's a little bit easier to see, is that you know, when we had the seismology version, it was empty, as I said. The photon epidural was really not empty, but refitting, you could actually start recovering a much more empty valley again, right? And so perhaps what had been going on here is that after years of worrying about the stars, we had neglected the planet side, the transit fitting side. And once we improved that, we again got to this more deep, more clean radius, um, radius valley for a much bigger sample uh, than we ever did with seismology. Right? And that has a lot of implications because we're we believe that the planets that contaminate the valley, that are inside the valley, might have a different history. We believe that for, for the operation models uh, of the X-ray and UV flux should create an empty valley, and so that everything that we might find inside might have a different history, might have a migration history, for example, um, or might have a more icy, uh, more icy composition than the other planets. So we really would like to know whether these planets are truly inside the valley or just this is just an observational um, problem. And it seems many do move out, not all of them, but many do. Uh, actually move out when you do the work very, very carefully. And so this is the um, net result of Cynthia's work. Um, this is the, the, the plot that's in her paper uh, where she showed the radius valley now in, I guess, four dimensions, I suppose, which is hard to show. Um, but this is the period radius uh, effect as before, right? You see the period dependence of the radius valley, but then also a stellar mass effect. And so rather than having a line that I showed you previously, you now sort of have a plane to cut through. Um, not only orbital period, but also stellar um, mass. Right? And that's perhaps not so surprising. Again, as I said, the effect uh, that we see, the period dependence effect, has to do with the amount of radiation we receive. And obviously, if you go to different stellar masses, you obviously also have a different level of radiation for the planets. And so you would expect to see this kind of uh, dependence on mass as well, uh, as, as is very nicely shown in here. And so that's a very clear effect. And then, interestingly, we try to fit for ages, and ages are hard to come by, uh, but you, know, you can get some of them. Uh, and we see a potential sort of tentative one and a half sigma age effect, which I don't necessarily want to claim is, is real, uh, but it's, it's, it's tempting to think that there may still be an age effect, which isn't, again, necessarily expected because the photo operation really should act primarily in the first 100 million years. And here, we're really talking about an age effect on a giga year time scales across the main sequence. Right? Um, so if, you know, if it's real, we can't make it out from this Kepler sample, but in the future, uh, with uh, missions like Plato, we're hoping we can get at this uh, much more clearly. Right? And finally, in Cynthia's work, she, she looked at the, the radius valley for different stellar masses, just separate, separated out here by four different stellar mass bins. Uh, and what you also see is that if you look at the valley for the higher mass bin here, it is very clean. And when you go to increasingly lower masses, uh, you actually start seeing a less and less clean valley. And in fact, for the, the lowest mass stars here, the valley all but disappears. Uh, it's not nearly as clean to kind of make out what's happening um, there. Right? And this is a, a new paper by Cynthia that's about to come out um, as she's in her final year of her PhD, uh, that we, uh, we tried really hard to reconcile this with the photo operation, the, the mass loss models. Um, there are some ingredients of mass loss models that could potentially explain this, and we've worked with some of the theorists to try and see if we can make this work. And the conclusion is we, we can't. The conclusion of the theorists, uh, to their own admission, is that it doesn't seem to match our models. And so that suggests there is to be at least some new ingredients coming in. Uh, the one I personally think is the, is the favorite one is, is, is more um, icy planets, right? If you see additional planets to those kind of rocky um, planets, you'd kind of have them at different sizes. They would have migrated from further out and kind of contaminated things. And at low mass stars, um, because the ice line is closer, we should start seeing more and more of them. And so it makes sense that this effect 
this contamination effect is happening primarily at those lower mass, uh, at those lower mass stars. And I think this is some of the clearest evidence today that we um, actually um, need, or you know, these are probably icy planets. And the prediction, if that's true, will be that all those planets here in the middle should be icy, right? It should be that you get a clean valley originally, and then you contaminate it with an additional number of icy um, planets. Right? So it makes a clear prediction of what these planets here in the valley should be, um, should be like. I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, but first, I just want to briefly highlight that we also looked into this cadence effect, the actual effect of cadence itself in some more detail. Uh, this is a more technical work uh, that was led by Julio Camero, who was a master student working with me at the time, uh, and is now a PhD student. Um, and he sort of looked at the details of the effect of the observing cadence, uh, forgetting about the radius value, just the actual effect. Um, and in particular for that, he used test observations, which, like Kepler, have these many different observing cadences. In fact, TESS has you know, a dozen observing cadences because they keep changing. Um, and so we have, sometimes we have stars that have been observed at different times at very different cadences. And so this is one example which has been observed at four different observing cadences. This is the same star uh, at different times, different observing cadences. And you can actually see very nicely how with the very short integration times, you get this very clean transit. And then with the longer integration times, increasingly you get this V-shaped um, transit. Right? And so what we set out to do was to say, you know, let's just fit all those models separately and see how well do we do in the real world case where we just model them and see, you know, does it make a difference? And so then you get posterior something like this where you get um, impact parameters here. And indeed, you know them better with shorter cadences. But more importantly, you get stellar uh, planet to stellar radius. Uh, and this you can see again, 20 second cadence, you get the cleanest posterior. So you really can get uh, planet sizes much better um, with um, these shorter cadences, right? And so then we did this more systematically, which is uh, shown here. This is sort of, we did this for hundreds of systems and then looked at the average effect. For example, here, if you go from 30 minute integrations to 20 seconds, you get an average uh, of 47% improvement in precision of um, planet uh, sizes, right? If you go from, for example, 20 seconds to 120 seconds, the effect is much more modest because 120 seconds is already pretty good, but you still get a bit of an improvement um, on average, right? And this is real-world data, so sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't, but this is uh, the average effect. Quantified, again, I think will be quite important in the future with things like Plato, which will also have uh, observing cadence uh, things to worry about. Right. And the final bit of my, of my talk here, I just want to um, go from sizes, which I've talked about today so, so far, to masses. Right. So I've said these planets come into two categories, um, Neptunes and Earths, um, and they're probably different. They, one have atmospheres, one category doesn't. And one way to kind of understand that much better would be to measure their masses. In fact, you would expect their masses to be quite different um, just based on the fact that you know, one has atmospheres, and these hydrogen-helium atmospheres are very uh, low density as such. Right? But uh, these kind of Kepler samples that we've so far wondered about, just can't, you can't really get planet masses for them. These stars are typically too faint. And the reason we've used Kepler for most of this work is that Kepler offers us the best sample. We have typically the best um, homogeneously studied sample. We typically have the best transits, much better than TESS. But we just can't do this mass work. So we're kind of forced to move on to different samples if we want to uh, get at uh, the mass question. Right? And so here is a, a quick example. Uh, I'm going to just show you some M dwarfs here from a recent paper uh, where we attempted this uh, exact thing in a sort of pretty naive way. Uh, so this is planets around low mass stars. Um, and you know, this is just only planets which have a mass measurement. Uh, they come from all kinds of sources, so I haven't done anything to them. Uh, we, we did add some new measurements here at, at the time. But so if you're, you know, if you're brave, I suppose, you can fit a radius valley through it, I guess. Uh, it's, not, you know, it's not a problem, but it's not, it's not so clean here. But you know, we expect it to be there. right? Um, so that's fine. And then we can actually look at these same planets and their masses. And that looks something like this. Right? Um, and so on this mass radius diagram, what you should see is that the, the, the Earths are actually kind of on a straight line. Um, and that straight line means they probably have a very similar composition. Um, and the Neptunes don't really follow that straight line. They're not, you know, they would be down here, but they're not. They're, they're much bigger, but not that much more massive. Uh, and that's consistent with what we expected to see. If you plot some models up here, um, these gray models here are kind of just rocky models, different kinds of rockiness, you know, more iron or more uh, rock, uh, but no atmosphere, so that's fine. And then the blue points, uh, you can't make it work with just rock. 
you need to start doing things like hydrogen and helium uh, on top of that rock to start you know, making, them, making them work. Right? So to, to first order, this picture seems sensible, but this is not really the sample we would like to, um, to, to do this kind of work for. Right? And this brings me to my, 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 my point here, which is that if you want to do this properly, you need to worry again about the stellar parameters quite, uh, quite strongly. I, I made the point here about stellar sizes for transits, but these masses typically come from radio velocity measurements. They come from measuring the movement of a star because of a planet. Uh, as with transits, we don't actually see the planet itself, but we see the effect on the star. And as before, if you change the mass of a star and the mass of a planet, you can get the same uh, effect. Right? So again, you need to know the stellar properties very well to be able to do this. Right? And so as before, we said, OK, let's set out to homogenize um, these stellar parameters for a sample here. And it's harder now because we don't have just a clean Kepler sample to work with or even a clean test sample. We sort of need to take things from all kinds of sources uh, there's only something like 100, 200 planets that have mass measurements, and they come from all kinds of observing um, sources, right? So we need to actually homogenize across various instruments and various parts of the sky and various properties of stars. But that's what we tried to do, and this is work led by my PhD student, Aharat Weeks, who uh, homogeneously tried to characterize 111 planets. We looked at FGK stars here, uh, and what we used is the Bayesian Stellar Algorithm, or BASTA, uh, which some may be familiar with, as it's a, a tool that's also uh, incorporated in part of the Plato Stellar uh, pipeline. Um, and so the, broadly, how this looks like is you put in inputs, um, such as parallax information from Gaia, or temperatures, metallicities, they can come from whatever source you like, uh, and then colors and, and so on. Um, you can put in other things like delta nu's and nu maxes if you're a seismologist as well. Uh, so you can do this pretty well. It then fits to isochrones in a very nice, MCMC Bayesian method to properly try to capture uncertainty from different sources and delivers posterior distributions of, for example, mass radius and um, H. Right. So it's isochrone fitting, but done, I think, in a very uh, nice statistical um, manner. Right. And so this is how that sample looks like. Um, the new parameters compared to the old ones. The old ones here that say NASA just mean catalog values from an exoplanet archive from NASA. Uh, so they come from all kinds of sources, but you know, broadly, they're on the one-to-one -one line, which is obviously what you hope to see. Um, but you, know, you have some offsets, which we're also hoping to see, because we're, we believe we can do this better than people have previously done. Right. So th this is what we did. And then we have now this sample here, which is now, I think, a sample that is much cleaner to look at, uh, where we actually believe that we understand the parameters quite well. And so we see this basic picture recognized with the, the Earths and the Neptunes falling in this kind of rocky and the more atmosphere-rich composition. And now, I think we're finally in a position to start studying this properly. For example, we can start zooming in here on the Neptunes and look at what they look like here. This is the, the sample of the Neptunes. Uh, and if you can see, the gray points are the old data points with the different stellar parameters. And you can see quite a lot of planets have moved quite significantly. So I think it's quite important to do this uh, the proper way. Um, and then we can start seeing things like this blue line here is an ice line. So this is, would be icy planets. And so we can start hoping to see if we can understand this now in detail, what's really going on. I've color-coded them here by stellar temperature, just to kind of see if there's some kind of trend. Uh, you might convince yourself there is one. I'm not so sure. But um, you know, this is what we're trying to, to start getting at. Um, and there are some tentative trends uh, that I think we can start um, making out. And I, uh, I apologize. I won't show you some of the uh, more interesting results, which we've just submitted to a, a, a kind of high-profile uh, journal. But, um, I think there's some interesting things coming out here. I just want to tentatively you know, show our HR diagram of part just to, to perhaps convince you that I think um, if you look at temperatures and, and, and radii, even with this isochrone fitting and even with pretty general inputs, we can, we can do this work pretty well. Uh, and including uh, color coding here by age, I think we can actually get um, you know, reasonably good ages across the main sequence from just isochrone fitting now because of how good Gaia is. Um, and I think the kind of um, picture that ages can only be determined from um, things like uh, seismology are no longer quite true, and I think we can hope to start seeing age-dependent effects also with, um, with, with, you know, with things like Gaia, if you do things right. Uh, and I think this, this will lead, as I said, stay tuned to some interesting um, planet uh, uh, property trends as well. Finally, I, I realize I'm almost out of time. Uh, I just want to say that there's an other part of this whole you know, mass work, which is, again, the planet side of it, uh, which is a, a, a PhD student 
uh, Hannah Osborne, who works on this, uh, and this is the goal of measuring new planet masses as well as maybe cleaning up some of the previous archival work. Uh, if, if possible, this is Hannah at uh, the ESO 3.6 meter telescope uh, observing at, uh, at HARPS um, in La Silla. And so, uh, just to show you very briefly, an example of a paper, uh, it says under review, but it was actually on archive uh, yesterday, so go check it out if you're interested. This is a planet, this is test light curves, um, this is the transits here, the blue dips in the real light curves, and then we did the, um, we took the spectra and measured the RVs of the star, uh, and this is the RVs over, uh, you know, quite a long, a long time from Harps and some Harps North RV, so you see the movement of the star here in meter per second um, kind of motion, and then if you kind of, you know, fold these, just to show you the kind of summary here, whoops, this is the summary uh, where you see the transits, very clean, this is the, the, the fold of transit, and then this is the RV, the sinusoidal motion, as the star kind of moves back and forth because of that same planet with the same orbital period as the transit orbital period. And you see the amplitude here is really small, meter per second, which is sort of, you know, walking around the room, this is meter per second level, right? This is what the star is doing, and it's light years away, and we can still measure this, which is kind of incredible, right? Um, so that actually works because of all the spectral lines, of course. Right? So when we do that, uh, we can put this planet into uh, the mass radius diagram and so on, uh, and I want to highlight we didn't pick a random one here, we picked one that we believe is kind of bang inside the radius valley. This is where I mentioned earlier. Those are the ones that we think might be icy because they might have a different history. So this one was a pretty clean case of like, it's really sort of in the middle. Um, so it must be weird. And indeed, if you put it in the mass radius diagram, uh, it falls here where there's not much else. Uh, and it is the, in those blue lines, which are the, the icy water fraction lines. And so it's tentative to believe that this may somehow uh, be one of those icy planets um, that we, we hypothesized would be, uh, would be there. And finally, it's highly suitable for atmospheric studies with James Webb, uh, and we've put in a proposal, deadline was yesterday, if anyone's, uh, yesterday night, uh, proposal went in by the deadline, and hopefully we'll get some measurements directly of the atmosphere um, as well. Okay, to wrap up, I just want to say I am also looking forward very much to Plato, which I think in many senses will combine the best of both worlds of, of Kepler and Tess, which we've used so far, right? Uh, so Ke but Plato will find a large number of exoplanet systems and investigate seismic activity in the stars. Uh, this is the fields of view of Plato, uh, south first, I suppose, and then Kepler here by comparison. Uh, so you see Plato field of view is much larger than Kepler, uh, which offers us a much bigger sample, which is important because it gives us brighter stars. Uh, which means we can now start doing mass measurements for Plato stars, for Plato planets, which we couldn't do with Kepler planets, really, while still giving us the much better transit precision that TESS just doesn't give us, typically. Uh, and so I think that combines those things. We'll be able to do these kind of studies uh, in, much, uh, in much better um, uh, samples and better precision. And finally, it offers us that promise of ages, which uh, I alluded to, I think, is kind of a bit of the next frontier in exoplanet science, is getting um, these age-dependent effects that we just haven't been able to study because we never had ages in the past uh, or reliable ages in the past. Right. And I'll just uh, say that I do lead some Play-Doh work packages and I wanted to put this one up uh, just because I haven't been able to talk about this at all and I felt like I should uh, uh, shout it out to, to my postdoc as well, Ed Bryant, who worked here on uh, some different work occurrence rates which didn't really fit into my talk, but I want to show one plot which is uh, he looked at how common Jupiter-sized planets are around different types of stars, in particular looking at low-mass stars. So this is occurrence rate, which means this is how common such planets are around such stars. So it's not just counting the number of known planets, it is counting the planets and quantifying how many we've missed to get the underlying occurrence of such planets. It was known pretty well around sort of solar-type stars here, uh, but then on the lowest mass, the pink data points here are the new ones, which we didn't know. And lots of models predicted you couldn't form giant planets around low-mass stars because there wouldn't be enough material for long enough to be able to form a giant planet at all. And we find that they are rare, but we have some clear cases of real planets, so they can form, uh, kind of challenging some of these, of these models. So that's work uh, from a few months ago led by Ed, uh, Ed Bryant. There's another work package here, uh, which is much easier to explain in this context because this is basically uh, on the topic of what I've talked about uh, for the past 45 uh, minutes. And if you're interested in joining, uh, please do let me know. We're definitely welcoming new members there um, as well. So with that, I'll uh, just leave up this summary slide. You know, I talked a lot about the small planets. Uh, I think the radius valley and the photo models and the massless models 
give us the framework to understand those small planets in. Uh, we understand the basic properties, Earths and Neptunes, mostly rocky, some with hydrogen helium on the Neptune side. But open questions, ice planets, how clean are they, what is exactly their history, and so on. What are their masses remain? And I think that requires this kind of clean modeling, homogeneous modeling of both star and planets very carefully, which I think very um, pleasingly is quite exactly what the Plato strategy uh, will be. So with that, thank you very much. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Vincent, for the wonderful talk. Uh, questions? Start from there. Hello. Thank you so much for this. Um, I've got two questions. First, a uh, small one. In your typical radius valley plots, where's the hot Jupiters? Is, are they way up? They're way above, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, so I didn't um, talk about this. Um, so I've cut off essentially most of those plots. I'll give you a real one. Um, maybe it's easier to see on a... I've cut off all these plots at basically four times. Here, I'll show you here. Uh, and Jupiter here will be about 10 times the size of, uh, of Earth, so it would be kind of twice as big. So in, um, the, in, the, in the left plot, around 10? Yeah, here. They should be there. They, they are there, but they're... Yeah, this, okay, this is, they are there. They're just very um, uncommon. So, so it's a selection. Um, this yeah. is a selection. So, so this uh -huh. is an actual uh, corrected plot for occurrence rate. So this is trying yeah. to quantify how many planets there really are. Um, and Jupiters, while easy to find, are actually very rare. So the actual rays um, is essentially something like almost every star has a, a Neptune or an Earth, like this kind of planets, mm. but only something like one in 100 have a hot Jupiter. And so um, these are just very small numbers you see here. Uh, they're just really much, much more rare. Yeah. Okay, and then the second question is, if you use short cadence data or in the limit, like ultra short cadence data, can you actually say something about limb darkening effect and the impact parameter? Uh, um, correlation? Yeah, that's a good question, to which, first of all, I like the ultra-short cadence uh, terminology. <laughs> uh, I think that's great. I'm going to use that. Um, I guess, in principle, you should be able to, right? In principle, you should be able to start um, learning these properties very well. Here, we've just fitted for limb darkening effectively. We didn't really oh. fix it before, because we wanted to see how well we could do. There's lots of kind of belief in, in the exoplanet community about whether you should kind of leave limb darkening roughly free as a fitting parameter, or whether you should kind of fix it based on stellar models, which yeah. kind of tell you something about limb darkening. They're not always easy to do one way or the other. Uh, and so here we've heard on trying to be finding out what's happening, so we left them completely free. And then they don't always match the predicted values. Mm -hmm. uh, but in principle, you know, we should understand why. And so I think in, in theory, at least, you're right, that we should be able to start using this to get at what are the limb darkening values. Yes. And do they match models? And if not, why not? Uh, I will say that probably bigger planets or even binary stars might be your slightly better science case uh, here, mm -hmm. but you know, to make it easier on the data side. But, but yeah, I think it would be an interesting thing to look at. Well, the, yeah, the nice thing is here you have only one star, because if you True. have binary stars that overlap, you have the, the limb darkening of both. Yeah. But okay, that's nice to, nice to know. Thanks. There's Thomas. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so you very nicely explained that photoevaporation is the main process responsible for the radius valley. Uh, I'm not super familiar with the literature, but I can seem to remember that there's another process, uh, core-powered mass loss, uh, which seemed to be called on by some authors um, as a f another explanation for the radius valley. So can you comment on the importance of that process compared to photoevaporation? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I, I, I simplified and maybe slightly oversimplified here. Um, when I said, you know, core power, ah, sorry, when I said for operation is the likely effect, uh, there are alternative models, um, including core powered mass loss. So maybe for everyone else in the room, um, the main difference, I suppose, is with foot operation, you're just saying the driver comes from the star directly, the XUV flux. Um, with core powered mass loss, the effects are very much the same, and therefore the predictions are very much the same, but the heat source is mostly the planet interior itself when it forms. Uh, and so you get uh, kind of a planet-dependent heat effect, but still many of your other effects should be similar, which is why it's been hard to distinguish. Um, part of the reason I didn't really put it up is because I think um, 
photo operation for one came first um, in, back in 2013, uh, and so there was very clear predictions which have borne out. Core-powered mass loss models have been harder to make work, uh, and even so, after we already knew what to expect, so that's, um, I think, uh, a strike. But more importantly, this, this paper here uh, by James Owen and Hilke Schlichting, who have been sort of uh, proponents for each side. So James has been working on photo operation, and Hilke has been really a core-powered mass loss proponent. Uh, in this paper, it sort of concludes that um, photo operation is very likely the dominant effect. And so um, from that, I think um, the debate is somewhat, if maybe not entirely, settled in favor of photo operation. Right, thank you. Here it is. Thank you. Uh, on the previous slide, where you showed that the, uh, the um, uh, procedures depend on the cadence. Do you take the cadence into account in your posterior? Do you, do you, you convolve? Yes. Um, sorry, I don't have my slide. Uh, yeah, we do. Um, so this is so, so. What has been done for you know as long as we can, uh, we've been doing this is we do try to take this into account. So what we do is normally in general you, you whatever your if you have a long cadence data, you generate a model that you originally generate at infinite um, time precision, so you know infinitely short timestamps, a perfect model, and then you convolve it with the integration time so that your model now becomes a 30 minute integration time model, and then you compare that to the data. And in principle. While this should give you an intrinsic uncertainty because you're kind of binning down things and you lose some information, you should not um, get an effect, right? What you, should effect, what you should see is if you go from longer to shorter cadence data, you get to a better precision. But if you fit the long cadence data correctly, you should have a bigger uncertainty, but you should still be correct in your posteriors because you can take into account the effect entirely. What I think we're seeing is that this just hasn't been done completely correctly in the past. Um, because you, what we were expecting to see is a, is a drop in error bars, but you know, within the original error bars. What we see instead is that there's many cases where we're three, four, five sigma away to levels that really, you know, given they're originally the same data really, uh, shouldn't happen. Uh, and so I think while this has been done the convolved way, I think it hasn't always been done completely correctly. Uh, and I think you know, um, the longer cadence data should be fine as long as you do things correctly, as, as I think we're showing um, here, this is posteriors, where you do the longer cadence data properly, then you get this bigger error bar, but they encompass the truth. Um, but this hasn't been historically done uh, correctly, and I think um, we, we're fine with long cadence data as long as you do it correctly, but if you want to do precise stuff, you still need the short cadence to get there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, go soup. Hi, Vincent. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I, I'm really glad to also see the discussion on the planet Mars coming in, because usually this is something is not being discussed. So my question is really related to um, the planet mass of sub-Neptune, so co the core mass, because it is supposed to be the dominant uh, component for the mass of the planet, because the atmospheres are thin in terms of planetary mass. So is there also a way to connect this to stellar masses? Because one might expect that uh, the cores, uh, the planetary cores around smaller stars are smaller than around the larger stars, so. Yeah, yeah, um, so absolutely, I think, or I hope. Um, so, so you're right, uh, when you look at those, those Neptunes, what's effectively happening is um, the mass here is kind of driven by the core mass, and then you put on a bunch of hydrogen and helium, and therefore they kind of jump in size to almost double the size usually. Once you put on a bit of hydrogen helium, you kind of double your size very quickly because it's very puffy. Um, but you don't really add more than like a few percent of mass, so basically your mass, uh, you know, if you go from an Earth to a Neptune, or it obviously happens the other way around, but you know, you, um, you go from roughly the same mass to basically twice the size, right? So, so the mass is dominated by the, the Earth, uh, by, the, by the cores. Um, it's been difficult to interpret, uh, especially the Neptunes here, because in the case of the Neptunes, um, while your masses should indeed depend on, on properties, uh, your radius are essentially so much driven by the atmospheric properties that it's really hard to see trends, right? So people have kind of started believing, I think, more recently that if you wanted to see trends, 
it's really the Earth, the Earth planets that are going to give you the best source of information, because the Earth-sized planets that have lost their atmosphere, if that's true, you get a much more clean measurement for their size and their mass, and it's going to depend only on those core properties, whereas for your Neptunes, that hydrogen-helium um, can really expand quite a range, even for very small differences in hydrogen and helium. And so uh, I think the future is probably in the, in the rocky ones here. Um, and you know, while I say they are on a line, this is actually quite a spread, right? So this is the Earth here is somewhere, somewhere like that. It has 30% iron, roughly. Um, and um, the 100% the iron line, this is essentially a model where there's basically no, no silicate and there's basically just Fe. Uh, that's, that's, that's really different from Earth, actually. Uh, so understanding this spread, I think, is, is the current um, focus. And we're trying to link that to some stellar parameters. Uh, and I think we have succeeded in linking it to some stellar parameters. Um, but we're not quite fully there yet. But yeah, I, I, think, um, I think this is definitely what we want to do. Uh, we would love to see the trends with the Neptunes. But I think the Earths are slightly easier in terms of interpretation. They're unfortunately quite hard in terms of measuring. They're the smallest planets in transit effects. They're the smallest masses. And so they're the hardest ones to do. Um, and typical error bars here are actually quite significant because they give you this kind of meter per second rate of velocity amplitudes, which is sort of this walking pace amplitude. And so it's, it's quite hard to do, but I think um, we're, we're getting there. And so maybe stay tuned for some, uh, some results on that front. Thanks. Last question from Pablo. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. I wanted to go a bit back to the cadence. So the plot you had with the posteriors and the, and the radius. Uh, so I guess it's a bit out of curiosity. Normally what I'd expect is that longer cadence gives you a broader posterior, which I guess makes sense between the 20 and the 600. But if I see the 20 and the 120, it just seems to shift the posterior. So I guess just naively, I would expect the light curve models to include the cadence in the fitting. So. They do, and in principle, you're right, right? So the, the, the dominant, I mean, what you would expect is you have a true value somewhere, I don't know where, and then you know, with, with 20 seconds, you have an uncertainty, and then the longer cadence, the more uncertainty. Uh, but since this is real world data, uh, and you know, mm -hmm. the data looks uh, something like this, this is just one transit, there's more data, but you know, uh, you're gonna just, by chance, get it wrong, basically, some mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, so since we, you know, we discussed for a very long time whether we should go this the theoretical way, because you can kind of mock up all those uh, cadences and simulate them and then fit them back. But we thought, you know, it's better to just go for real test data because that tells you something about the, the real world, like how much does this matter? Uh, and ultimately, how much it matters depends not just on cadence, but also on how good you do, right? So if you have a very noisy light curve, right, if this mm -hmm. transit was really difficult to model in the first place, it wouldn't help to go to shorter cadence that much because you would just have a big uncertainty based on photon noise. And so the better your photon noise, the more you then have the observing cadence need to, to, you know, to, to have that other source of error. So I think the answer to your question is just that uh, in real world data, occasionally uh, we're off just you know, by chance. And you even see that here in the, you know, this is the average of a whole bunch of fits where we compared hundreds of planets to different cadences. And when you cross this, this gray line here, um, you actually have cases where you do worse <laughs> uh, in, in error bar with, um, with a better cadence, right? So, so you can see that in some cases, just from a fit posterior from a Markov chain, you, you seem to suggest a bigger error bar, even though your cadence gets better, which we shouldn't have in principle if those light curves were the same. You can't, you know, you can't lose information by having a better cadence. But they're not always the exact same light curves, right? They come from a different test sector, and so they might just not have the same quality. So it does happen in the real world, and that's why we kind of made those conclusions on average for samples um, to see how much the effect was. Okay, thanks. All right, um, we are unfortunately at the hour, so I have to uh, stop the discussion. Uh, I see there are more questions, so don't hesitate to go win to Vincent uh, after this and discuss, ask your questions. Also, as a reminder, visit, uh, so Vincent is on two-day visit at uh, our institute. So if you, again, want to discuss something or you have a proposal for uh, joint projects uh, with uh, Vincent and his group, feel free to find him and discuss. If you can't find Vincent, try to find me and I will tell you where Vincent is. Yeah? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Oh, and let's uh, thank Vincent again. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>